And we are recording. Welcome to the CTSC webinar for June 19, 2017. I'm your host, Jeanette dopp -Heide. CTSC is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high-quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about CTSC can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is using the blockchain to secure Providence metadata with Drs. Richard Brooks and Tony Shellam. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcomed and encouraged to ask questions during this session using the chat box that those of you were already using. You type questions there. And we also uh, plan on uh, having time at the end of the presentation for questions uh, as well. And having said that, I will hand the microphone over to Richard and Tony. Richard and Tony, welcome. Hi. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm Richard Brooks. Tony? I'm Tony Shellam. Okay. okay. Uh, we're going to be talking about a project that we have with uh, uh, with NSF, with the um, yes, with the CI CI initiative, and what the project is, it's uh, looking the the quest was to have technologies to secure provenance metadata, and um, our, our proposal was to use the current uh, cryptocurrency technologies to do that. Uh, in order to, and we're going to, so for, for doing that, we're going to be discussing uh, some of the cryptocurrency technologies. We're putting up a poll to ask the level of knowledge that everyone has. Uh, thus far, we've got 100%, okay, 100% experts. It would help us uh, if we would get some feeling about uh, how, what the level of expertise is so we know better uh, how much raw data to put into it. Uh, another thing is the, we put in 23 slides for 45 minutes, which is uh, slightly sparse. So it would also be, we'd like for it to be a bit more um, a conversation, so actually we're in encouraging questions throughout throughout the session and then we would like so if you have questions then feel free to post them and we'll try to interrupt and answer them throughout because I think that would be more effective and again we're starting off with a poll which currently looks like okay more novices which is reasonable because there's a fairly new technology, there's a fair amount of medium, and a couple of experts. Um, okay, and we would also like to start off by acknowledging the NSF funding of this project, and then also giving the uh, normal disclaimer that what we're saying is uh, representative of our expertise and not necessarily representative of NSF's opinions on the, or the federal government's opinions of anything. Okay, so go on. Um, okay, why have it? So basically the idea behind provenance information is to have information about where the information came from, so you have a better knowledge of how much to trust it, rather than just assuming that all digital copies are perfect in perpetuity, it's sometimes quite useful to know a bit more as to where the information came from, as shown by the XKCD slide. And then uh, provenance metadata, is, provenance is basically a formal way of preserving information as to where the information came from. Uh, with, within, the, in a, within the military community, this has also been called um, information pedigree. 
Uh, so with information fusion applications, one of the concerns was that if you just gave a piece of information and said we trust this 85%, that loses a lot of nuances where you might have a lot of things based on a single source of information where if you you know, modify how much you trust a single source, and that modify might modify how much. And so the idea behind provenance is it can help you find the sources of errors and allow you to have a better idea as to confidence in the in the results and have a better justification for decision. Uh, later on, we've got um, three use cases that we think that we think provide a bit more motivation for uses of this type of system. And Richard, if, could I just put in a couple of points? Is that I, yeah. I would like to, talking to students about this, typically talk about wines provenance and you know art provenance. And if there's a there's a movie, I guess it's a recent version of the Thomas Crown Affair, where the edges of the painting are hidden so that if you make a you can make a beautiful uh, counterfeit, but you can't make the edges because they're they're hidden from view unless you possess the actual original, and the notion that provenance somehow is being protected is present. It's part of the edge. In other words, it's it's hidden data. It's not necessary to perceive the original art object, and it can't be forged. So we care about the fact that the provenance itself is is trustworthy in what we're going to present today. Just like you wow. might think about is your is someone yeah. can forge provenance. It's bad. Go ahead, yeah, sorry. In, uh, yeah, with uh, paintings and objects of art and, and valuable objects, that's a, a very strong part of, how, how much of the value of an object is that you know where it came from and that gives you a better, a better feeling as to whether or not it really, what, really is a Rembrandt or a clever forgery. Um, one of the use cases that, we're, that we that we put together, is, for example, is with uh, forensics data. With forensics data, at the at the beginning of the process, people take a font, uh, take a, a disk, they create an image of it, and then they work on the image to find, say, contraband, child pornography, etc. And then later, the case goes to trial, and it's important that in the trial setting, you can prove that that information came from that disk drive and ha had not been modified afterwards. That would be probably a good motivating thing to, to think about throughout. So that's provenance, and there are a number of provenance systems that exist. Um, and here we've got a, a brief survey with a number of the more common systems that are, that are in use, and then the and then the different schemas that they take. A lot of them taking annotations in XML, a lot of them looking just at data or can look at data and how the data was produced. And a lot of times, you know, it can be, you can use SQL queries or then the browsers with visualizations to go through them. And what, you're, what they're dealing with now is different ways of storing the data, visualizing the data, and exploring the data, but what's been missing in this space is how you secure the data. And one of the issues that has to be dealt with in, all, in most security systems that's very difficult to deal with is, is insider threats. I mean, do you just trust it because it's in this database? How do you know that the database hasn't been modified? How do you know that the people who put in the data you know, that they're telling the truth. And so that would be any anything that's looking at this has to look at the issues of, again, it's looking at where the information came from and how you can capture that sort of thing in a trustworthy manner. And with that, we were then, oh, whoops. Something happened. Yeah, excuse me, I think I, that's okay. okay. There you, we're back. Okay, we're back. Hi. Okay. Um, so, what we thought we would, we thought that a good starting point from the for this type of work would be 
the cryptocurrency technologies such as Bitcoin, and we're going to be referring to Bitcoin as all of the cryptocurrencies during this, which is definitely not the case, but we don't want to go into the differences between all of them. Uh, basically, we're interested in looking at the blockchain technology. And the idea is that Bitcoin is a, okay, it's a cryptocurrency. It's being, it's seen as a type of value. It's given value because you've got a limited number of these digital tokens. And they've come up with a, an interesting way of producing a distributed system that's considered trustworthy. And since Bitcoins have real physical, um, okay, since Bitcoins have real physical value, um, it's given people have a lot of incentives to try and subvert the system. And they have not been particularly successful. Uh, we're going to talk a bit later. There's been a, there have been a number of applications of bitcoins. Um, there's been a number of applications of the blockchain that are, that are looking at doing something somewhat similar to what we're doing, and such as people will pay caches and they can store them into into um, a text region of the thing, but that's very limited. You can, you know, it, it basically will give you a time span for the digital object that corresponds to that hash. Or another thing you can do is called burning bitcoins, which will then take the um, one of the addresses and replace them with hash values which uh, effectively destroys the, the Bitcoin. Um, all of these uses are not really supported by the Bitcoin community, and they're somewhat limited. Again, we're going to talk some more about that. Uh, so uh, basically, the blockchain is a distributed data structure. It's each of the peer nodes has, or not each, many of the peer nodes have a complete copy of the blockchain. Other, other wallets that are using the system do not. They will only refer to their own, refer to their own uh, currency. Um, so the blockchain is a ledger that stores all of the Bitcoin transactions, and it eliminates single points of failure. A major portion of this is the mining system uh, where uh, a bunch of people, a bunch of people work in parallel to create the next block that goes onto the chain. They verify all the transactions that go in. They produce, when you create a blockchain, uh, create a block that's put onto the blockchain and stays there, you get a Bitcoin to remunerate you for that work. And the number of blocks that can be entered into the system, uh, number of blocks that can be entered into the system is limited. Uh, that's done to keep the currency from inflating. And um, OK, the, let me see, finding, since a bunch of people are working in parallel, it, can, it also limits the ability of somebody to take over the system and uh, forge transactions. Uh, there are a number of issues with mining for our application, uh, and we don't have the same threats as the crypto. Uh, so for, in fairness, Richard, let's take, put in uh, that. I just wanted to say, if I could just put in for a second, that we are we are literally, uh, let's say, lifting the technology for a purpose for which it was not originally intended, because it's a really great distributed data structure, which doesn't have require trust or centralization, right? So it's important to realize we're not actually 
our, our use, there won't be a cryptocurrency when we're done. There'll only be provenance. I just wanted to put that thought in. Yeah. We're just we le are, leveraging. Yeah, our, our architecture, we're taking existing provenance systems and merging them with a modification of or something that takes pieces of the Bitcoin software uh, and we're trying to then leverage that to add security to the existing provenance system. So one of our design goals is actually to do as little new software production as possible. But the, the mining portion, in particular, we do not have to look at problems of, okay, two things that Bitcoin does that we don't have to do is they have to check that people are not spending the same money twice. We do not care if somebody enters the same transaction into the system twice. That's not a problem. And uh, Bitcoin also has to limit, very much limit the number of transactions that are going through the system in order to keep this, in order to keep inflation from occurring. Uh, it doesn't bother us if people use our system a whole lot. That's not a that's not a threat we have to look for. And so with both of with both of those problems, the mining system that Bitcoin develops is very computationally intensive, burns a lot of cycles, and burns a lot of energy. So that's those are things that we're going to be getting rid of. So we want to eliminate the single points of failure, and we also want to eliminate the possibility that people can manipulate the system. Uh, insiders can modify the system. So for that, we are going to adopt the blockchain. Um, basically, a blockchain is a sequence of blocks, and each block contains signed hashes of the previous blocks. And again, this, the miners that produce the blocks are chosen in a random fashion. In the current Bitcoin system, they're chosen by everybody trying to solve the same cryptographic problem. They, they have to produce a random nonce that causes the new hash to have certain properties. And that's something that can only do by can only be done by brute force search. And so by doing that, you can you can reduce the possibility that uh, somebody could take over the system and end up producing forgeries or just let's say defavorizing a certain user or favorizing or yeah. Uh, preferring certain other users, and okay, so that's how the blockchain works. Again, if I were to change the first block here, so I want to change it here, uh, I not only have to deal with the issue of the signatures here, I also have to deal with the issues of hashes and signatures all the way down the line. So where it might be possible for somebody with a line of computational power, let's say IBM or Fort Meade, to modify one, one of the blocks, it would be really impossible for them to modify all of the blocks afterwards and also to do it in a distributed manner. It becomes just computationally something that's not going to happen. And again, this has been shown to be pretty reliable mainly because people have a lot of incentive to do it and there are no cases of people actually being able to modify the blockchain. People have stolen the currency by taking over wallets. They've stolen the currency by all sorts of manipulation, but actually affecting the, actually attacking the blockchain, I don't know of any existing cases of that. So Bitcoin, you take a new transaction, you put them into the block. Uh, you have proof of work, which is solving an intense math problem, which is basically finding a random number 
that produces a hash that has certain characteristics. And so the reason for this is it chooses who's going to be the miner, it produces new Bitcoin, and it stops inflation because if you have harder problems, it will take it longer to occur. And within the Bitcoin uh, ecosystem, it chooses automatically the difficulty of the new problem to keep it at a fixed rate. And then everything runs across the same peer-to-peer -peer network. And since it's highly distributed, you don't have a single point of failure. And that adds security. Uh, the idea, again, being that if it's distributed across the entire world, then it will be very difficult for it to be taken over. This has worked pretty well there. Currently, there are a couple of issues that are occurring with this. One is that mining is actually not very lucrative right now. So what people have done is they're joining pools of, you've got a big pool so that if a large number of people join together and split the profits, you can have a more reliable stream. Uh, but when, again, when you've got the big pools working together, then you have the problem of possible collusion. Another issue with this is that uh, they've been developing custom ASICs that do, the, that do the mining very, very well. And that particular market sector is predominantly uh, run by Chinese companies right now. So if you look at China as a single entity, then you know, to, to subvert the blockchain, you need to have 51% of the computational power. Okay. Richard, we've got a question here okay. from Sean Pysert. He said, he says, I'd love to understand the use case more here and why work is therefore the right approach rather than distributed trust for a private blockchain. And in the latter case, do we need full blockchain rather than just Merkelson? Merkel trees. Merkel trees, um, sorry. OK. Actually, the, Sean, the discussion here is to more motivate that we're not using work. Uh, just to explain that currently they are they are using proof of work. In fact, what we're doing is we'll talk some later about the lightweight system that we're developing. And we have the the Merkle trees and then we're just everyone verifies the transactions. So the person that produces the block, produces the block, verifies the transactions, and people then insert the blocks into the system, verify the transactions. And in essence, it is pretty much, in essence, it is pretty much Malkal trees. But uh, what we are doing with what we're calling lightweight mining is we're distributing, we've got a distributed algorithm to decide who inserts, who comes up with a block and inserts it. So in, in some ways, in some ways what we're doing is what you suggest there. In other ways, we are distributing that decision making process in a way that stops, say, one party from taking over and say deciding I'm not going to take entries from um, from Dartmouth or from uh, Lawrence Berkeley, I'm you know somebody else would come that would come later on that's not uh, dropping entries from a particular entity. So you're you're right, and that's what's and that's basically what's being what what we do later. This this discussion is motivating why we're not doing that. But that is that is a good question and basically you're pointing the same direction that we're going. 
Okay. Okay. So it's distributed, and so the Bitcoin features that we've got, storing data, minor selection, security, distributed consensus, and the mining. Um, for metadata, you need to store the data. You have to have some minor selection. You have to have the security with the distributed consensus. We don't have to deal with currency issues. So we have the blockchain, we have the lightweight mining, and we have distributed consensus that we're doing. So the main components of the of Bitcoin in our system, okay, Bitcoin does proof of present ownership and it's concerned with the preserving the values. We're doing proof of past ownership, which is I have this or this is, you know, this is what I did and this is where I got the data from, and it's all it's all considering the data. So again, uh, if you have the data, it doesn't matter if you're saying that you have the data multiple times. The blocks are done by having a difficulty in a nonce. We're defining it. The mining is resource intensive. We're dropping that because we don't see any reason to heat up the planet more just just to save the you know to, just to save the value. And then security is based on comp computational difficulty. The security is based on cryptographic signatures tied somewhat to the Byzantine General's problem. Uh, very similar to very similar to what they have, what they've been doing with Bitcoin, but not exactly the same thing. So the system is um, you have your data inputs. In this case, we're talking about a security application, so you would have uh, security logs that go in through the data provenance system that registers it. You'd have a hash of the data. We have we decided not to store the data inside the system. We're just storing links to the system, a timestamp, the user's information, and then that's signed, and then it goes into the it goes into the right. The miners produce the blocks, they sign the blocks, they distribute that, and then currently there's going to be four ledgers. We only show three here. One's going to be at Clemson, one's at Auburn, where the two people running it, and then we also have uh, agreement with Florida International that they'll have a ledger. And we have to decide where we're putting the fourth one. Um, Bitcoin transactions. Okay, I'm going to make this a bit larger so that we can see it better. Uh, you have the version number, you have the inputs, and you have the hashes of the previous transactions. You have the outputs, you have the timestamp. Uh, ours. We'll have the user ID, which is the public key. Version numbers we don't need. Input counts, so you have the previous information and indexes. We don't need the signatures here because we're not looking at double spending. And you have the outputs. So we'll say where the inputs came from. You'll have a pointer to the data. You'll have a hash of the data. We'll have the length of the information. We'll have an XML of that. And then that is signed. And then that goes and then that gets put into the block. And so for that, we've added user ID and the output entries to the provenance information and the signatures. And we've removed the things that are related to safeguarding the value of the transactions and removing and removing the uh, removing double spending. We don't have to look for that. Okay. Again, here's the structure of the block. We added a signature from the miner, which adds accountability for that, and we removed the difficulty target and the nonce. The nonce was in Bitcoin. Again, you have to have a certain signature for the hash and you come up with a random number that produces that signature. And the difficulty target 
says how difficult how how difficult the mining needs to be in order to stop inflation. So since we're not doing the we're not doing the extent of computation, we can just remove remove those parts of the of the block. Uh, lightweight mining. Basically, what we have is an algorithm that allows us to choose a miner or set of miners in such a way, in such a way that you can't have collusion in choosing it. And everybody generates. Okay, so we have our set of our set of servers. Um, this is also slightly different from Bitcoin in that. And Bitcoin, you know, sort of random people can join. We're assuming that this will be a bit more of a controlled environment. So the servers are known, and you've got a certain number of servers. And, and so every miner would generate a random number. Um, oh, uh oh, this does have a, we've got to correct that. This one has a bug. Uh, everybody generates a random number, then they compute the hash of the random number. They broadcast the hash, then they calculate the sum modulo the number of servers, and the miner, and then after that, everybody, everybody, okay, after they, after they, excuse me, they broadcast the hashes when they have the hashes, then everybody has the hashes, then they can broadcast the random numbers. So that everybody's committed to the random number, then you can sum those numbers, and the miner with the ID of zero with the sum modulo n, or an ID equal to the sum modulo n, creates the new block and broad and broadcasts it to the other servers. Excuse us, we have to correct that. There there are errors in the algorithm there. So. Instead of having the proof of work mining, this has very limited has very limited computation. It does allow the miners to be selected randomly so that you can't have people preferring that. Okay, so you can't have people preferring one user over the other. Uh, everybody does the transaction verification. We don't produce new bitcoins and we don't stop inflation. So we again save on the computation, and we have what we feel are the verifications that are useful for this particular application. Um, so what we're doing, again, we are adopting the existing provenance systems. We're taking a large amount of the Bitcoin code base. We're replacing mining, and we're also replacing the data structures that are being stored in there, which is one of the main problems, which is one of the main problems with uh, the existing application. There are existing applications that are using Bitcoin to produce timestamps for data. Is that you have to really torture the data to fit it into a small hash value, and also the fact that the Bitcoin community really hates that type of application. They look at it as spamming their blockchain. On the other hand, it is an effective way of getting a timestamp. It's possibly a very expensive way of getting a timestamp for the moment. Uh, use cases that we have currently, so you would have a principal investigator. They would come up with a data structure that says, this, you know, say you've got a paper that you've put together. You would say, these are the papers I'm referencing. I got this data from these users. I ran this program on it. You would have hashes of the input data. You would, you could have pointers to the previous, to the previous information that was in the blockchain that we had, and you would, you would then store that. So if you went back and you wanted to reproduce the results from the previous from the previous user, you could then get the program, 
You could use the hash to verify that it's the same version of the program that they use. You could then get the data inputs that they have. You could again use the hash to verify, you know, to verify the content of the data, and you could try to reproduce the exact same information. And in that way, you could then trace things back. If you don't get, if you get the same results, then that would verify what the, what that researcher did. If you know, and if not, you could then see if the you know if there was a problem with the data or the program or whatever. So that's for the data integrity use case. And basically, you would then have a tree where you could trace things back, hopefully. Uh, for data forensics, it's could I just say one thing before you go on, Richard? Just sure. before you go back to go back to the previous, I just wanted to point yeah. out that how ubiquitous this problem is. When even to the point of homework, where people might just copy the data and all submit the right answer, or it's not even copying the program. This is this is pervasive. This issue of having to actually have re reproducibility and. Um, and trust in what's being computed and the value of what's decided based on these uh, these findings, whether it's intellectual property or um, like awarding a patent or awarding tenure or you know uh, academic integrity. This is really hard to do, and a system like ours, connected with a, um, other tools, is going to make it the norm rather than the unusual case. So I think it's important to point that out and as you're getting in the blockchains of course sorry the ledgers won't be owned by the same academics that need to prove the integrity or of their work <laughs> that's the other thing so it sort of it creates a whole new level of scientific reproducibility can come from this I just want to make sure to point out that is that is highly valued by NIH and NSF and others of course in the scientific community but it's pretty hard to do and now this is really trying to eliminate things like people um, having to retract papers and having fake results and all that horrible stuff yeah. that happens from time to time in different areas. Uh, it's, it's a problem in a lot of scientific domains uh, where you've, uh, there are some domains, particularly psychology, where they've tried to reproduce some of the more famous results from previous research and discovered that they're unable to do that and in particular uh, because scientific journals have a bias towards publishing papers with positive results, you actually end up polluting the scientific pool. I know that, and I'm not going to discuss this more, but uh, one of my students, we, we had a, we did, we found a way of doing some security uh, experiments with real ground truth. Uh, with operational data, and we found that the results that were in the literature worked incredibly poorly. And then when we submitted that, and the journal said, uh, you know, the results look bad, so we're not going to publish this. Which, uh, again, this is this is a known problem in all domains of science. Um, data forensics, again, you have a or you have a crime lab technician that gets a disk, the disk, they image the disk and they typically do a hash of that and then they they store that, I mean currently they, they store that, people work on the image of the disk and they try and find, you know, uh, evidence of say using it with Silk Road or with child pornography is a very common thing that they talk about and then, ow, and then it goes, then when it goes to trial, the lawyer for the other side, you know, just basically will always attempt to say, well, that, that data was added after the fact and, you know, and the crime lab then forged the, the signature and it's very difficult to prove. Uh, with, actually, with this use case, we bounced our design off um, data forensics people with uh, CERT and the FBI and they both said, yes, this would be something useful. So the idea is you've got a lot of different crime labs that are working together. When, when the disk is imaged, they produce, you know, they produce a transaction that we then go into the blockchain, 
And if you have if you have that, uh, and a bunch of different organizations are using this system, then for a defendant's attorney to claim that the data was forged, um, you know, you would have the timestamp, you would have the signature of the technician and the date that they did it. Uh, that would be pretty good proof of the sanctity of that of that data and to look for it being changed after the fact, again, if you say have, say, CERT, FBI, and local law enforcement using the same system, for it to have been modified after the fact, all of those entities would have to be colluding, which is not very credible. So in this case, you put the, you put the data into the system. Uh, people can use that to run tests, to verify the things, at the, uh, at the time of trial, the courts, the attorneys can have access to the information. You could also then store the test information and the results in the provenance system. So you could show the programs that were being run to search for the information and the results. And again, you would have that as a proof. The security use case, uh, basically, there we would do the same sort of thing with, we could have the security logs and you could have a um, tamper, uh, most of the systems with UEFI have a tamper proofing module, so you could then also prove, you know, have it be signed by the tamper proof module on the computer. And so then you would have hashes of the logs, timestamps, and dates. And at that point, you could use that information. And if the system is compromised, at the very least, you could see whether or not the logs were, whether or not the logs had been tampered with after the mm -hmm. case, which is a problem nowadays with, with the system. Uh, if you want to store more data in the system, you could. The um, danger with that is that the size of the blockchain is going to explode. Uh, and can I just point something out? One more, one more sure. thought, Richard, for me on that is if you go sure. back just a little quick. Um, so this is how we make continuous monitoring and digital forensics uh, systems be a process that so the person is always doing things with sufficient chain of custody and uh, let's say uh, process that everything can become evident versus they go from a mode of just being a network defender to being one where they sort of turn on all the processes for being a forensic analyst. Uh, so everything is forensically valid in some sense. And so that connects with the previous use case, actually. It's important to realize that the things that you get in real time that might not be available later on some systems, like they're very lightweight, like IoT, are all going to be done correctly in the sense they could use as evidence. So it's, it's an important um, side effect of doing stuff like this. That, that's all I wanted to say. Uh -huh. Okay, our current status, we've finished the initial software development. Uh, we're working to integrate it with multiple provenance systems. Um, we're going to provide APIs for putting in private meta, metadata. Uh, the private metadata basically would be layering in um, uh, the current the current system is a pretty good system for exchanging information with with public keys and so on. But it would be useful if um, let's say for let's say for a medical application, you might want to have it so that you can you know use this to to track how data has been developed and has been modified over time, but you need to restrict access to the data. So it would be possible to build a key distribution protocol into this where you could control who could actually access the information that you're storing in the blockchain. And it, would, it should not be terribly difficult, but it's something that we haven't put into, into version one. Another thing is to do 
uh, security analysis of the lightweight mining process. Uh, it would be also useful to do the same sort of security analysis of the uh, Bitcoin mining process. Currently, uh, the literature that I've seen pretty much says it seems to work and it's practical, but there isn't really a convincing, it, you know, one of the old jokes that something works well in practice, but how does it work in theory? Where, you know, it's working, people haven't been able to steal money from it, so it seems to work pretty well, but there hasn't really been um, a rigorous explanation of the details as to, to why this part works. Part of it is that uh, with, the, with the distributed process and the rate that things are being produced and the system keeping the longest chain that that will tend to favor the better data. But again, that seems to be uh, accepted, but not really a good rigorous explanation as to why as to why that works. So that's what we're what we're working on at the moment, uh, and also everything is. Uh, I don't think that we've made public the current development version, but after we've done some more testing, this will all be made available as public source software that people can use. So then, do you have any other words of wisdom, Tony? I think we I think we've covered the idea that we're actually trying to um, create a system that we would actually want to use ourselves to in a number of different dimensions everything from you know our scientific processes to connecting to software uh, to enhancing what happens in the science of digital forensics and even regular you know the American Academy of Forensic Science worries a lot about the authenticity and quality and ethics of forensics and so this also ties to data that's part of the forensic pool, but it's not digital data like you know DNA and things yeah. like that. So I think we're trying to really make an impact on, uh, with this tool, and it's different, I think, than what a lot of people are saying. They've got a blockchain process or something in a company where basically they're just hashing, they're hashing yeah. uh, data, and that's it's really not the same thing as what a lot of things we see in marketing literature are. I think so. I think it's important to point that out because everyone says they're doing blockchain. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because there's a, a, a real split. In the security community, I've seen a lot of people that pretty much feel the entire thing um, is overblown marketing speak, which I, I don't think is quite fair. I, I think there are some really interesting innovations that they came up with. And with a number of the applications and the new implementation, some of the altcoins are very interesting. And, but on the other hand, there are a number of attempts to commercialize these, uh, the concepts that do not appear to be um, very well thought out or do appear to be people just trying to um, commercialize on something because it's hot at the moment. So there's a real dichotomy there from my point of view. Um, we definitely would like questions from the audience, however. And maybe more use cases to consider for the future. OK. So uh, Jim is asking, how should our network intrusion detection system differentiate between good uses of blockchain protocols, provenance of science results, versus malicious use, which is like Bitcoin mining on NSF-funded supercomputers. Ah, which is something we also noticed, some of the unfortunate things. Um, uh, network intrusion detection is a problem, is a, is a problem all, all its own. I mean, in this, the system that we've set up, uh, which in some ways breaks the, the basic Bitcoin paradigm, but we felt that it was reasonable, is that people using the system would be authenticated. We'd 
we have it basically set up. We have it set up now, where you know either Tony or I could have somebody produce an X509 cert that we would sign, and we would give it to them, and they could then use that to access to access the system. So that again, anybody, uh, the blockchain would be public. Everyone could read it, but people entering things would have to be. Uh, would have to be authenticated, and also the servers would be a limited number of servers in well-known places. So that would be one point. The other point is uh, again the the choice for mining, and the choice in this case for the lightweight mining is between servers that are well known and you know, well known within the system and have been pre-authenticated and they're not doing a lot, a lot, a lot of computation. Although my, my, to get back to the mining on the supercomputers, my, my understanding is actually that the ASICs are probably faster at doing all of the hashes than uh, most HPC systems would be. So even then, they're doing. They're they're probably fighting a losing battle, but if they're using the MSF supercomputers, on the other hand, they're fighting a losing battle with somebody else paying for their electricity, because actually it's paying for the electricity that's making mining uh, not that profitable in enterprise in general. Uh, so. I, I don't know. Well, I guess I answered it in some ways, but in fact, but the, that would well, say our Richard, system but, would be burning yeah. up a lot of would not be a lot of poor time. And we, yeah. there wouldn't be a motivation to put it on a supercomputer for the reasons that you gave. But also, our protocol isn't going to look exactly the same. We certainly could look how to make a signature for it if that were really a problem. But it's going to be like, it's basically, we're, we're going to create a system which as it expands, and this could be in data transfer nodes, or it could be in Places like you know CAC or Exceed, where there there are donor nodes that are going mm -hmm. to participate. They're trusted for now. We're going to work with. They're going to and they're trusted in the sense that they're going to be enrolled, but the they themselves are well defined, and so all that traffic could be well characterized. And it's going to be, but it's, it's essentially it's provenance as a service is what the system comes out as it scales. And it could be very clear when that's going on. Uh, it could happen from, for example a parallel computer producing results and wanting to get the provenance of a, let's say, a big data distributed data set. So it could be an issue to understand if something's good or bad. But it's not, yeah. there's not going to be a motivation to do a heavy compute because there's no money to be made. <laughs> yeah. so there's no reason to, to do the bad thing with our system. Yeah. Sean has a, a good point, too, that most of the public HPC has limited cycles per user, so they're burning up their time. Uh, but the system we're producing would have the option of limiting who's using the system and also of defining uh, the servers that are going to be actually administering the blockchain so you could limit the limit access to this type of protocol to those nodes. So that would be, you know, if the people that are using the system want that, they can do that. Um, but I think Sean also has a good point that most of the HPC users are just turning up their cycles and for something that's useless for them, although that should be um, hindered in any case. I think people have been convicted of misusing resources to hope for doing Bitcoin. I think that the thing is is that where our system will actually cre help create the opposite effect to help people demonstrate proper use of re the government resources for, for, for computing. And you can have communities of provenance. I think that's important. Richard touched on that earlier that uh, with keys and so mm -hmm. forth. Not all provenance has to be available to all people. But the fact that you could get into the point of creating differential provenance as important computations are being performed would reduce the fact that data sets are, uh, are considered have low integrity. And I think one of the areas we can care about a lot in the high performance computing end, it's sort of beyond this 
this presentation is ensuring that people yeah. trust the results of important parallel high-end computations when they impact policy, for example. So that's another path that, you know, scalable versions of some of these, you know, if you're thinking about creating terabytes of data, we want to make sure the terabytes of data and those results are trusted. So there's more, more to this. In, so you might have this in, being used inside an HPC system, but it's for a good purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, also one could look at, say, plagiarism issues a bit more easily too, right? If somebody's, if somebody's taken some, some code or results and not properly attributed it, then looking at the hashes would also make it easy to find that. Uh, scaling of our approach to high-performance computing. Again, the, the approach that we've got is pretty lightweight the the choice among the the choice um, among the different mining nodes is done simple you know it's done with a couple of broadcasts the um, and then the producing of the blocks is very straightforward the issues with scan two issues with scaling will Probably, or the ones that I would look for, uh, one is the size of the blockchain, and the more data that you're putting into it, the more it's going to to grow. On the other hand, storage space is very, very, very cheap, so that's not too bad. Uh, the other one is the you would want to have as many servers as possible, right, so that you have the most redundancy. On the other hand, on the other hand, the problem that you're going to have with that is if you have too many servers, then the you know, number of messages that are done by the broadcast is going to is going to increase. So however, you know, considering uh, the scale you know, considering the scale that the current blockchain, that the current Bitcoin system has versus the scale that we're likely to have, I don't think the broadcasts are going to be that bad. And the more nodes that we have, the more we can resist, you know, downtime of individual nodes. So that would, I think that would be more of a, a positive influence. The issue would be most likely the size of the you know the size of the blockchain that we produce. Whereas I think for both Tony and I, um, it would be extremely gratifying uh, to have that, you know, to have enough users of a system based on this that that's actually going to be a problem. Did that okay, answer your question, uh, Sean? Go ahead. We ran out of time. I think. Yep. Uh, Sean says, yep, that addresses the question. Um, so uh, let's just do a last call for questions since we're um, coming in at the end of the presentation. Um, and that's me. And, and that's oh, go ahead, Richard. Oh, I just, the, at the end, we have our contact information and the, the references. Right. Um, okay. And you guys are are hopeful to receive more use cases or or questions from uh, from interested parties, correct? Yes, 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 yes. Yep. So I will um, I'll include your contact info in the in the email that I send out when I send out this video. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, I'm not sure we have any more questions, and and they can always uh, talk to you offline about it. So I want to just uh, thank everybody for coming to today's presentation. And uh, just a real quick um, message about next month. Our next presentation is going to be July 24th. And the topic is Internet 2 Cyber Infrastructure by Paul Howell. And I want to thank everybody for joining our presentation today. And thank you so much, Richard and Tony, for presenting. And um, do, uh, any last minute uh, comments you wanted to make, gentlemen? Oh, I think uh, we appreciate having users in the future. <laughs> yeah.
We, we do hope to get to the point where we'll have users in the future. And this is a really serious point. I mean, this is, is a practical under uh, CICI or SISD. Our point is to make practical prototypes that could be pushed to the next level. So as we work forward, we will, our goal is to go to a sustainable infrastructure uh, that can be used for real. This is not a theoretical exercise. I think it's important for everyone to know. Yes, yeah, I agree. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Richard and Tony. And uh, mm -hmm. with that, I will end the recording. And um, gentlemen, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.